15, 2 Kings 10 and verse number 15. I brought a message along these lines about three or four years ago, but I'd like to update it a little bit this morning and bring it to you. 2 Kings 10 verse 15. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right as my heart is with my, thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. And he said, If it be, give me your hand. And he gave him his hand, and he looked him, took him up into the chariot. Verse 16. And he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. Look at that verse there. He said, Hey, buddy, is your heart right? And he said, Yes, sir, my heart's right. He said, Well, jump up here in this chariot and ride with me. So he pulls him up in the chariot, and he said, Come and see my zeal for the Lord. I want to preach on that word this morning. And the subject is, Have you lost your zeal? Zeal. If you had to give a definition of the word zeal, I hope you could do it right now. Zeal uh, basically means enthusiasm, excitement. And the Bible teaches that we ought to serve the Lord with zeal. Now, here's what happens to most Christians. When you first get saved, you've got a lot of zeal and no knowledge. You've got all kinds of zeal and you're excited and everything, but you ain't got no sense. And then as years go by, you learn everything and you learn church and you learn, doc, learn doctrine and you find out nobody's perfect and you find out this, you find out... And then you get a lot of knowledge uh, in here and lose your zeal down here. Actually, you're better off with zeal without knowledge than, than knowledge without zeal. You should have zeal uh, for the Lord. There's, there, you should have knowledge and it's good and you should seek knowledge. But some people got it all up here and nothing in their heart. And that's a bad shape. Churches are losing their zeal. Enthusiasm. What, I mean, the best way I could understand, help you understand zeal is look at a, a, a Duke and North Carolina game. You want to see zeal? That's zeal. That's fanatical zeal. Those are fanatics. I mean, this gun guy got up there and all these boys had their shirts off and they didn't have a shirt on. One of them had a big D wrote on his belly and the next one had a big U wrote on his belly and the next one had a big K wrote on his belly and, I mean, they're on TV like this, y'all, and they're screaming, and going, we're number one, we're number one, we're number one. Okay, okay, y'all. You know, what, you know what that is? That's zeal. You know why people like college basketball? That's enthusiasm. It's enthusiastic. And, 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 you know, a lot of people used to have a lot of zeal for the Lord. They used to be enthusiastic about it. Now they come into church, look like their mother-in-law just moved in with them uh, permanently, and they've been sucking on lemons on the way to church. And I'm telling you, we are, uh, nobody wants to go to something that's dead and dry. If you like to go to a funeral home and sit around, there's something wrong with you, buddy. I'm telling you right now. I only go for one reason. I'm a preacher and I have to. Other than that, I have no... I know people go down to funeral home and every time somebody dies, they don't even know them. I just, you're, there's, there's something weird about you, I'm telling you, if you like that. It, normal people don't like stuff like that. But the Bible teaches that we're to have zeal. Uh, somebody said it like this. They said the size of a dog in a fight is not near as important as the size of the fight that's in that dog. You ever seen a little dog... They can whip every big dog in the neighborhood. And, I mean, and you know why? He thinks he can. He, uh, he, and he does it. He does it somehow or another. He's got zeal. He has enthusiasm. Churches should have zeal. Singers should have zeal. Uh, preachers should have zeal. Sunday school teachers should have zeal. Nothing should ever be boring and dry. So I'm going to talk about zeal this morning. The old Roosevelt said one time, he said, I'm only an average man, but I work harder at it than the average man. That's a good philosophy to go by. Somebody else said this, every man that God has ever used, listen to me carefully, and anybody who's ever succeeded in anything, business, sports, any, anybody who's ever been a success have one thing in common. They are all characterized by a consuming zeal which enables them to overcome any obstacle in pursuit of their goal. We'll say that again. Uh, everybody who's ever been a success in this life at anything is consumed. There's something in them that, get, that helps them to overcome every obstacle 
in pursuit of their goal. In other words, they got their eyes on something and they're going to go for it no matter what and just keep, put the pedal to the metal, brother, and let's go and get it done. Amen? Amen. Ain't that the kind of people that get somewhere in life and that's the way you're going to be as a Christian? Excited, enthusiastic. Uh, I want to say a few things about it right quick and let's do it like this. Let's first of all talk about false zeal. There is false zeal. Much of today of what passes off as true spiritual joy is nothing but false zeal and fleshly energy. You know that. And uh, fleshly rather than spirit. You see this a lot in these TV ministries and you see it a lot. Singers are, are, the, are the worst in the world uh, for having false zeal. I was at a church one night years ago and I wasn't, by, right after I was saved, I was about 19, 19, 20 years old. I got saved when I was 18 and I was just learning. I didn't know how all this worked, and I was just learning. I went to a church one night where people shouted and they praised the Lord, and uh, I was sitting over here on this side like this, and I was just getting a blessing. There was somebody throw up their hand over there. Somebody jump up over and say, woo, hallelujah. Somebody jump up over here, and I was sitting over here like this, and for some reason, I just happened to look, and there was a woman sat right in the middle, about this section right here, stood up, and she was in the, in the middle of the aisle and started coming out coming out this way. And when you do that, you know, you come in this way and say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. She came all the way out like that and I just happened to look that way and uh, I thought, well, she's got to go to the bathroom or something. And she, she said, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, come all the way out here and then went, and went, whoa! And I'm going to show me the high heel popped the ceiling, brother. And I was sitting over there thinking, I don't know about that. Is that... How'd she know the spirit was going to hit her when she got out there? <laughs> Felt it coming on, I reckon. Do uh, you know what that is? That's false zeal. I've been in a lot of revivals. They bring in a bunch of singing group, and they'll come in there and sit like they're about to die uh, during, during the announcements and, you know, and everything, and, and just sit there and look down like this, and the preacher say, all right, come on. And they get up and say, well, hallelujah, hallelujah. Boy, it's good to be here in the house. You know, well, whatever. I mean, they wouldn't even say amen or didn't even bring their Bible and then go into this act when they get on the stage. That's not what I'm preaching about this morning, okay? That's false zeal. You know what that is? That's a put on. And nobody in their right mind, like, I, I can't believe how gullible some people in churches are that they fall for junk like that. You know, here he is, little Roy, and he's going to pick one for us now. Let's all, and they all turn at the same time. They all, they've got them hands memorized. They know when, ah, that's a bunch of junk. That's false zeal. That's like the preacher who sits there and sleeps through the first sermon and then fusses everybody for not saying amen when he's up preaching. See, that's false zeal. That's, you, you see a lot of that. They memorize their lines and, and uh, you about know, uh, how, you know, how it's going to go. You know, that's all I'm talking about. But let me talk secondly about misunderstood zeal. Do you know what misunderstood zeal is? I'm telling you, uh, if you've been in church long and you try to do something, you figure out what misunderstood zeal is. When you really, really, really want to do something for the Lord and then, bam, it gets slammed right back in your face. Has that ever happened to you? Hurts your feelings, don't it? Misunderstood zeal. This happened a lot when I first got saved. We wanted to do everything. We'd go give out tracts and preach, and sometimes we didn't do it exactly right. But if a young convert, if a young convert's got a lot of zeal and enthusiasm, leave them alone. Don't pour cold water on them. You let them. They may not have it all figured out like you do, but at least they're trying to do something for God and their heart's right. Amen? Uh, I remember years ago one time, it was during the holidays, like we just came through, and uh, uh, my phone rang, and I answered the phone, <laughs> and this lady, it's been years ago, y'all don't know who this is, she said, uh, is this Danny Castle? And I said, uh, uh, yes, ma'am, it is. Uh, sometimes I say, when I hear that tone of voice, I say, maybe. Uh, uh, why you want to know? She said, she said uh, I have a complaint. I said, oh. Oh, why did I answer the phone? And when people want to call them fuss like that, you got to be nice to them. I said, yes, ma'am. What's wrong? She said, you people at your church have got my son to all the pieces. I said, ma'am, I'm sorry. I don't, do I know you? She said, no, you don't. And I said, well, I, do I know your son? No. I said, well, what did we do? It's these people at your church. They're out here at the shopping center. They're out here giving out this literature. My son is to all two pieces. And I said, why? What? Tell me what we did. And what we had these boys at the church, and they'd been out giving out tracts, and they had all these tracts like this, and uh, 
it was a, a Christmas track, and the name of it was Ho Ho. You don't see them anymore, Ho Ho. Like, and it's got Santa Claus in front of it, and he's got a pitchfork like it, and horns coming out of his hat and a tail. And uh, it's pre- it is pretty rough track, but uh, it's it's true, really. What? And all it's saying is that Santa Claus has replaced Jesus at Christmas. And anybody in their right mind would agree with that, right? Santa Claus gets all the credit. Jesus, that's all he's saying. It wasn't nothing too bad. She was bent out of the frame, buddy. She said, I can't believe you people out here. My son is tall. I said, ma'am, I, what did, what did? She said, she said, I'm telling you, you I demand an apology. I, I said, ma'am, I don't tell them people what they can give out. I'm, I ain't their boss. I don't tell people what they can do and what they can't do. She said, uh, well, I, I said, well, listen. She said, he's, now he's thinking Santa is the devil. I said, why don't you tell him that his daddy is really Santa Claus? She said, I did. Now he thinks his daddy's a devil. I said, oh. I said, I am so sorry. I said, God. I said, man, that ain't the way we meant it. That's misunderstood zeal. She said, she said and, and finally I got her to give me her address and I went and bought that kid a Christmas present and mailed it to him. <laughs> I never did hear nothing back from him and everything. But you know, sometimes you're really out here trying to do something right. Have you ever tried to do something right? All you husbands know what that's like and get misunderstood. The classic illustration is the guy's sitting at work one day and suddenly it hits him, it's his anniversary. And he done forgot the last two or three. And, he, and, 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 he, and she mad and ready to cuss him out and kick him out and everything else. And he's sitting there at work and all of a sudden it hits him. Bam! Oh, it's my anniversary and I ain't, I'm not going to forget it this time. I'm going to do this one right. So he orders a 12 fla- a dozen of roses and he, he, uh, he has them all brought in, boy. And then, meanwhile, back at home, everything goes bad. She gets up that morning, bad day. She's like, he's probably going to forget her. He ain't going to even... Miss. And, and uh, she, she goes down about that time. Uh, she's got a terrible headache. And when she's going down the hall like this and puts a load of clothes in the washing machine, baby crying, she got the baby on this side and throws clothes in the washing machine and gets that started and, and her head's a-busting and uh, the hose busts on the washing machine and soapy water comes out on the floor, starts getting in the carpet and she's trying to mop it like that, slips like that and it breaks her ankle and the baby's screaming, telephone ringing and everything else. She goes in there and just throws the baby on the bed and meanwhile, back at work, Lover boy is sitting there. Boy, she's going to love this. Man, I can't wait to see her face. It'll be just like when we first met. She'll melt when I give her these flowers. The first mistake a man ever makes is thinking he knows how to, what a woman's going to, how she's going to act. Big mistake right there, buddy. If you think they're going to be mad, they won't be. If you think, oh, she'll love this, she'll start crying. So help me out here, guys. Y'all scared? Too? Yeah, that's right. But anyway, he's sitting there saying, boy, she'll love this. So he, he works on that thing. Work, he works, works, works on it. He plans it all out. Oh, back at home, it's awful. Her head just... Boom, boom. I mean, hurting in her eyes. You know how it pops out like that? And boy, the babies are crying, you know, and everything. The old, old lover boy gets off work, comes home about 5 o'clock that evening, and he comes up the sidewalk. And he turns up those roses like this right here. And he, like that, and he rings the doorbell, you know. He's going to be standing there when she opens the door. And he rings the doorbell. She comes down the hall. I don't know who that is. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'm going to cuss him out. As soon as I say, and she opens that door, and there he stands grinning like that right there. And she's right there and goes, ah, bam. Slams that door right in his face. He thinks, what in the world did I do wrong? So he goes, ding, rings again. And she says, she owns that door and says, I can't believe you. Here I am, I've had the worst day of my life. The baby screamed all day. My head's a busting. I got water all over the carpet and floor. And here you come home drunk. <laughs> you know what you call that? Misunderstood zeal. I mean, you're trying your best to be good to somebody, and blam, it gets thrown back in your face. Now, that's going to happen if you're in church very long. You're going to try to teach. You're going to get up and sing, find out somebody laughed at you. You're going to get up and try to do something, somebody goes, ugh. I mean, something's going to happen that you're going to get misunderstood, and it's going to hurt its with a feeling. 
And you know what it's going to have to do? Grow up and be strong and say, look, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing it for the Lord. And, and don't, don't worry about your zeal when it's misunderstood. So this guy's coming down the road one time, and he's going this dirt road, and about that time a car comes sideways around there and almost hit him, slang like a cat, and this girl hollered out the window, and she said, Pig! And boy, just fire shot through him. He hollered back out the window and almost hit him and said, Swine! And he went around the curve, and there's this great big pig right about that big right in the middle of the road. And she was trying to warn that fool. And see, he, did, he didn't, he thought, that, you know what that is? That's misunderstood zeal. That means when you really want to try to be good to somebody, bam, it throws it right back in your face. You've got to get used to stuff like that. It happens all the time. It sure does. It happens all the time. Lord have mercy, y'all. Uh, you just got to think sometimes, I mean, I've, you've heard me tell a story about uh, a lady. Uh, let's just say, let's just say, this doesn't happen here that I know of. Let's just have a lady actually did pay for these flowers right here and a lot of money. Um, you may not look like it, but you start, these fake ones cost. And let's just say that you went and you spent your whole paycheck on this flower arrangement. That's several hundred dollars to have them things made like that. And, and, you, uh, and you work on it and you work on it and you say, Preacher, spring is coming and I want the church to look nice and I want these beautiful, I'm going to put them in there. Preach, oh, I just can't wait. And you work all week on that and you get in here on Saturday and you look at them and you, you mess with them and you change them. You get back here and look and, and then you fool with them here a little bit and you mess with them here a little bit. You just can't wait to see how everybody likes them things. Next morning, you walk in and you're just standing there waiting to hear the compliments and there's two ladies standing there saying, who brought that mess in here? <laughs> and you go, oh my, I don't know. Them's the ugliest things I've ever seen in my life. Don't even match. Ain't nothing yellow in here. Boy, that can hurt your feelings, y'all. That can hurt your feelings. You ever had your feelings hurt? Yes, you have. I am, people think preacher ain't got no feelings, but we do. And I mean, it hurts, but you know what we got to do? We got to just rear back and say, listen, I didn't bring them flowers in here for you. I brought them for the Lord. I ain't preaching for you this morning. I'm preaching for the Lord. I'm trying to make him happy. I'm trying to satisfy him. That's misunderstood zeal. Number three, true zeal. What is true zeal? True zeal has Jesus Christ as its object, and inspiration. That's why the old preacher said, I have only one passion, him and him alone. True zeal is not craziness, it's not insanity, it's level-headed, but it's exciting. Nobody likes to hear a preacher that's not excited. Nobody likes to hear a Sunday school teacher who's not excited. Nobody wants, a, wants to watch a ball player who's not excited. I mean, you don't want to see him just walk down the floor like that, bouncing the ball. You don't want to see him say, well, throw it over here. If I see anybody, I'll throw it to them. We'll get a touch there. Man, you want, you, want, you want that crowd standing on their feet? You want to say, stop! He comes back like that boy, and he's ready to throw it. Uh, you know, I mean, that's what you want. You want to see it exciting. People like it exciting. If you go to a, a car race, I mean, if you, you see them little kids, them little kids playing t-ball and, and uh, all kinds of sports, anything, you want it exciting. That's what true zeal is. Amen. Uh, I read about uh, General MacArthur. Here's uh, you builders in here this morning. They're back in the war, General MacArthur, he said this. He said we need to build a bridge some way for the men, the troops, to get across the river. He sent to his head men. He said, how long will it take to get a bridge built? They said, three days, sir. He said, all right, have the draftsmen draw them up and then get them to you and start the action. They said, yes, sir. And a few, and about two, two, a couple of days later, he said, is that draftsman got them plans done yet? They said, no, sir. He said, well, tell him I want to see the plans. Uh, is, uh, he said, okay. And uh, they said, you want to see the bridge, sir? He said, well, uh, the, the bridge is already built. In three days, them guys went out there and built them bridges, and the man hadn't even drawn the plans up yet. That's excitement. That's zeal. That's like somebody said, all right, let's get this done. Let's get to work. Listen, brother, you get a church full of people like that. If we had a bunch of people in here this morning that say, you know what, let's get something done for God. You, you know, there's enough people in here to crawl out all over these counties this, e this evening, fill this place full of young people tonight, but you lack one thing. You lack excitement. You lack zeal, and it's hard to keep it. When you're all excited when you first get saved, you want your whole family to come. You want everybody to come, but it wears down and wears down and wears down 
True zeal keeps the Lord first and gets the job done for him. Number four, fading zeal. Fading zeal. Here's where you fail him. The flame dies down. Big old fire burning real hot. I know so. I mean, I know so many people. Every time we have youth rally, they get fired up. Glory to God, preacher, you can count on me. I, they don't miss Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday night. When and then a little at a time. Uh, you know, a little at a time, a little at just like everything else. The fire burns down. Fading zeal. Some of you here this morning used to be on fire for God. You used to serve. You used to take tracks to work. You used to try to win. You used to read your Bible every day. You've let your zeal, fire, die down. I I'm never can cease to be amazed at the way these athletes and stuff train. Them guys out there on that football field, some of them people, they put their self through torture to get out there, y'all. The, the weight lifting and the running and the pushing, and I mean they throw up on the field and everything to push their self and push their self, push their self and push their self. And, and pe- we think that we can just stay right with the Lord without even trying and stay on fire. You're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. Lastly, number four, and I'm through, or five, whatever it is, maintain zeal. Maintain zeal. You say, all right, preacher, you got me. How do I stay on fire for God? I'll tell you how. It is possible to be kept by the power of the Holy Ghost at the boiling point. In your thinking, praying, meditating. That's why David said, while I was musing, the fire burned. There's got to be a time when you put the Lord, you and the Lord. Now, now look, people. You can't just do everything and go everywhere and have everything and eat everything and just and lay around and do nothing and expect to stay on fire for God. It don't work that way. There's going to be a few things you're going to have to say no to. There's going to be a few times you're going to have to turn and walk away. There's going to be some things you don't you that you're friends want to go to that you say, no, I don't think I can go there. There's going to be movies you say, hey, no, we're not going to watch that. Anymore. You say, boy, it's so exciting. I love this part, but it's got them bad parts in it. There's going to be some times if you stay right with God where you're going to have to say no to some things. Look, we're not going to hell, man. Don't be such spoiled brats. Let's get right with God and get some zeal. Listen, I'd rather, I'd rather, have, I'd rather have five people that is full of zeal than a hundred people that knew all their doctrine and knew everything was what was right and wrong and was dead as four o'clock. Years ago, two girls come to our church and they said they were 18 years old, both of them, got right with God, just got out of high school and they got on fire for the Lord and I mean they got on fire. I mean, you could just tell. They sat on that second row, they sat there and everything I said, it was just like this right here and I th- they heard me talk about the bus ministry. These two girls come up, 18 they said, Brother Danny, Brother Danny, Brother Danny, we want to do something, we want to do something, we want to do something. I said, um, okay, I, I'll, I'll figure out, I, I can't let them do nothing. They don't know, no, they, don't, they can't be a Sunday school teacher. They can't, I'm, I don't know. And, and they uh, hit me up again. They said, Brother Danny, we want to do something, we want to do something. I said, okay, there's a boy over there who got this van, and he drives that van every, every Sunday. He picked up three or four kids. Why don't y'all go with him Saturday and try to get some kids to ride that van to church? They said, Okay, took off running. Honestly, I thought that was the last I'd ever hear of it. About two Sundays later, I was standing up here like this, choir coming down. You know, I stand here like I always do. They come up, they come up, preacher, preacher, come here. I bent over like that, and they said, we had 16, we had 16, we had 16. I said, 16 what? They said, we had 16 kids on the van. We had 16 kids. I said, good. Wow, that's great, y'all. Hang in there. About two Sundays later, I was standing there again. These same two girls come, preacher, preacher, come here a minute. They said, we had 32, we had 32, we had 32. I said, you had 32 kids on that van? It's a 15 passenger van. They said, yeah, is that good? I said, yes, that's good, amen. Don't let the cops find you. I mean, they had 32 kids, brother, crammed in a 15 passenger seat van. 
They looked like the Archies coming down. They, their head was sticking out the window. There was little kids getting set on. It was full. Them girls didn't know who the Antichrist was. They didn't know how wrong every other denomination was. They didn't know all like all you geniuses. But they had one thing that church members don't have. Zeal. Amen. They said, we want a bus. We want a bus. We had a little bus. I gave them that bus. And in a few Sundays, they had 53 kids on that bus. In about a month. They didn't know Greek brother. They thought an epistle was an apostle's wife. I mean, they had no clue. Some of you ain't laughing because you don't know the difference. I'm, I'm telling you something, ladies and gentlemen. It's not what you got in your head all day. It's what's in your heart that'll make you serve God. What's in your heart this morning? Maintain zeal. Give you an illustration. I'm through. Years ago, a hardware store owner was offering some young boys to deliver merchandise a job. Three boys applied for the job. The first one come in, he said, yes, sir. He said, here's your first assignment. He said, I want you to take this vacuum cleaner down here to 789 Chestnut Street and deliver it to a Mrs. Peterson. He said, yes, sir. He took off, stayed, and stayed, and stayed, and stayed, and stayed, and stayed, come back, and he said, sir, I'm sorry but there's no such place as 789 Chestnut Street. Here's your vacuum cleaner. He said, all right, you can go. Next boy come in. He said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to take this vacuum cleaner to 789 Chestnut Street and deliver it to Mrs. Peterson. He said, yes, sir. He went off. He stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed. And he come back and he said, sir, I hunted her forever all, all over the place. And she there ain't no 789 Chestnut Street, but there was a 789 and a half Chestnut Street in which a Mrs. Peterson did live, but she moved away. He went a little further. He said, thank you. Next boy, come in. I want the job, sir. Okay, take this vacuum cleaner down there at 789 Chestnut Street and deliver it to Mrs. Peterson. He went off and he stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed. Come back, clapped his hand and said, anything else, sir? He said, did you get that done? He said, yes, sir. He went down and found out there wasn't no such place as 789 Chestnut Street. And then he got to asking around and found out there was a 789 and a half Chestnut Street and Mrs. Peterson used to live there. So he got to asking around and tracked her down on the other side of town and found Mrs. Peterson. Of course, she hadn't ordered no vacuum cleaner and talked her into buying it. And he got the job. He got the job. In other words, he didn't go knock on one door and say, well, I tried. He didn't send a text and say, Miss Peterson, you got a vacuum cleaner coming? He? No. He said, I will go track her down and by the grace of God, get it to her. That's zeal. That's something you can't teach a person. You either got it or you don't. My message to you this morning is, if you've lost that, if you've lost that enthusiasm for God, get it back. You say, how do I get it back, preacher? You get in this book, take you a day off work, maybe. You get a day off, you get a tooth pulled. You get a day off, you break your finger. You get a day off, you get the flu, you'll take a day off. I can't, you'll get the flu and you'll take one off. Take a day off work sometime or a Saturday or a sometime and you've put your nose in this book and read it and pray 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 till God gets in you again and it starts moving like he did before. Maintain zeal. Now, people, you know as well as I know, we got enough dead churches and dead... Amen? Lord have mercy. I get, we get emails all the time. England, Australia, Africa, all over the United States... Then if we had a church like that within 100 miles, I, could, I wish I could read y'all some of them. If we had a church like that within 100 miles, we'd come every service. It, you just, it's hard to find anybody with any kind of enthusiasm for the Lord. Do you remember a time when you used to be enthusiastic? Let's maintain that zeal. Let's stand by our head for prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. 
She's coming to play softball.